Well, hi, and here we are. Yes, once again, it is time for Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. And as always, we get to play with the unexpected as much as anything else, because this is a podcast that's really a conversation between me, your host, Mike Hingson, and a guest sometimes more than one guest, and it's about having a conversation. So who knows where the conversations are going to go? Um, but that's as much today the responsibility of Ashley Dunn as it is for me because Ashley is our guest, and she's the one that created some of the thoughts that we're going to put in the conversation. So Ashley, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Does that feel like a heavy weight on your shoulders now? No, this feels um, – I'm excited. I'm excited to be be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I mentioned to you right before we started that I know that I'm a good company, not just with you, Michael, but with your previous guests as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to listen to quite a few different episodes. And it's quite amazing when we really think about the human experience and the stories and how we've all taken these different paths to end up where we are. Um, so I'm grateful to be in good company and excited to get started. Isn't that a lot of fun? And it's so enjoyable from my perspective to have the chance to to talk to so many people like you and hear life stories and hear what people are doing and just have some great conversations. It really doesn't get any better than that as far as I'm concerned. Yes. So let's start by you telling us a little bit about you, you know, you, where you're from originally and all that kind of stuff. And tell us about your life. Yes, yeah, so um, I am from Silver Spring, Maryland, um, which is a suburb right outside of the D.C. area. And um, my family uh, is West Indian uh, from the island of Grenada. Um, and my mom is British, um, but her mom is from Grenada as well. Um, and so my grandmother immigrated to the United Kingdom um, in the 60s. And um, she had my mom and her sister there. Um, and then my dad is from Grenada and my dad immigrated to the U.S. in the 80s. Um, and then my brothers and I, uh, we came around in the 90s um, and have had the privilege of growing up in a really diverse area where we live, but also um, in a very diverse household. And um, that has very much shaped the way that I see the world, um, the way that I orchestrate my household now with my husband and my son, um, but also my um, understanding of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and how those topics kind of form this synergy of um, myself. Um, and I've been able to learn more about myself by learning more about um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, as a teacher, for many years um, as a student uh, growing up in, um, uh, or going to school rather in, in an environment that wasn't so diverse, what mm -hmm. that felt like. Um, and now in my current career as a learning experience designer. Well, before we get to that, I've got to ask, because I'm now really curious, your parents are both essentially from Grenada, but... Mm -hmm. How did they meet? How did they get together? Because clearly they were in, in different kinds of environments. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my parents met, um, friends introduced them, but they physically met at a block party in Brooklyn, um, which everyone who's familiar with Brooklyn um, or the area knows that it is, there's a very, very strong West Indian population. Um, so my mom, having immigrated recently from the UK with a very heavy British accent, um, where she grew up in Birmingham, England, she grew up around a lot of West Indian people as well. Um, so you can go to Birmingham and everyone is going to have a Jamaican accent or yeah. a Grenadian accent or a Trinidad accent, even though you are technically in the United Kingdom. Um, and so very, very much they were both kind of attracted to those same communities that would give them the familiarity of home without being physically in their born home of sorts so they met at a block party my wife's parents well grand grandparents actually were were somewhat from england and a lot of our relatives are there but they're from the manchester well yeah they're from Mm -hmm. South of England, Mausel and all the area around there. So 
Um, there are a few of them who definitely were of the opinion and demonstrated very vividly that they were psychic and in tune with such things being from that kind of environment. It was a lot of fun. I have never been there. Would love to go sometime. Um, I have not been to England. I've been to Ireland, but not England. So it is on the list. Oh, yeah. It's very nice. And to go back there probably will be such a fulfilling experience for you as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, I, I've gone back a few times, like as a tourist, <laughs> um, but I've also, I studied abroad there. I went to the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England, which is a much northern part of England, um, where I saw a lot of like lighthouses. Mm. There was a lot of fishing, like a completely different perspective of what I would typically associate with England. Um, and I'm really glad that I had that experience because I also was able to connect with um, my fa- half of my family still lives in the Eng- in, in England, all over in Ketrin, um, London. Um, some do live in Manchester as well. So we're all kind of spread out. So it was cool to kind of get to be a little bit of a tourist, but also feel like a sense of homecoming. I guess the big area where they lived was, well, Mausel, as I said, but St. Ives and, and, and that whole area. And Definitely fishing people in the in the family as well. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes. So, have, well, when you were over there, uh, I have to ask: Did you uh, tour a lighthouse? Have you been in any lighthouses? Yes, um, actually, I, I have. I um, I was an English and Africana studies major with a minor in education, and so when I went to my college and said I want to study abroad. They were like, hmm, where exactly does Ashley fix fit into this mix? <laughs> um, I could not teach abroad because I needed to have a different certification for England. And so they um, put me into the environmental studies study abroad group, um, which was pretty awesome. Um, and one of the things that we studied uh, during that time was like overfishing. Um, We went to Norway and we had the opportunity to kind of see the sea levels rising and what was Mm. happening in the environment. Um, And then where we were in England afforded us the opportunity to be able to go up into some of um, the lighthouses that were along more of the shore type areas um, and get to see kind of um, uh, how our ecosystem was working, (laughs) but specifically what and how our how we were negatively impacting the environment. Um, So that time I did get to go into a lighthouse and spoiler alert, it takes a long time to get up there. Um, (laughs) There's a lot of steps. It is very narrow. Spiral Um, staircase. Yes, that spiral staircase. Um, And you can't turn back. So (laughs) you need to commit to making it all the way up to the top and commit to coming all the way down because there is nothing in between. You can't turn back because there are people behind you or why? Yeah, because, yeah, there's people behind you. And yeah. You're going down the spiral spiral staircase backwards, which is its own set, has its own set of issues. <laughs> so, Yeah, to say the least. Yes. Well, we won't worry about lighting lighthouses and all those sorts of things. I collect old radio shows, and one of the most famous shows for more than 20 years is a show called Suspense. And one of the most famous suspense shows is a show called an episode called Three Skeleton Key, which takes place at a lighthouse. And this ship appears and goes aground on the uh, island or the shore where the lighthouse is. And there aren't people on the ship. It's infested with rats who all go up and try to get into the lighthouse. It's a great story. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That sounds super interesting. Well, at the end, the um, ship leaves the shore. Uh, Well, no, the ship doesn't leave the shore. Another ship comes along, and all of a sudden, uh, somebody's playing a trumpet or something, an instrument, and all of a sudden, it stops, and then the ship goes away, but there are no more rats. So you can imagine what they're trying to tell you. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Three Skeleton Key. It's a great, it's a great show. Vincent Price and other people um, played it in it as well, but Vincent Price was probably the most well known. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> but so you went to to college, and what did so what did you end up training to do or come out of college doing? Yeah, so I went to 
to Dickinson College, which is a smaller liberal arts college in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, and I studied English. I double majored in English, Africana studies, and then um, I minored in secondary education. Mm. Um, and I came to many of those decisions as I got mm. a little bit further along um, in my studies. I initially came to college saying I want to be a lawyer um, and I want to go into policy. Um, and I had the vision that I would be able to go into education policy. Um, and that was very much of interest to me at the beginning um, of my career, but or my the beginning of my studies rather. Um, and then as time went on, I thought, you know what, I actually want to teach. <laughs> I want to engage with people. Um, maybe one day policy is somewhere down the line, but I don't want to read policy documents for a living. Um, and so I kind of created this mix um, um, of, of what I wanted my degree to be, which would allow me to be an English teacher, but also allow me to use the English classroom to be a channel to celebrate the Black voice and Black experiences. Um, and that is how I combined my Africana studies degree with my studies in education. Wow. So very broad experience, no doubt about it. So did you come out of college and then go into teaching or what? Yes. Yeah, so um, I went into a teaching program out of Baltimore um, where I taught with other um, women who were also going to teach. And we lived in community, which is, I guess, more of a colloquial term of we lived in a convent, um, <laughs> which were former convents in the Baltimore area. Um, so myself and these other women, we all lived together in what we called community. And whenever we had people over, including our family, they were always confused as to where they were going and how they were going to get there when they realized that our home was either attached to a church or attached to a Catholic school in that Baltimore area. Mm. And so that is how we, <laughs> that's how I started teaching. Um, I start. I was living in community and I started teaching in um, private schools in Maryland because I was a certified Pennsylvania teacher. Um, and I could not pass my certification over before the time in which I graduated mm -hmm. um, from Dickinson. Well, so you taught in private schools and, and kind of went on and taught from there. How long did you teach? Um, yes, yeah, so I taught in private schools for four years, um, and then I transitioned to public schools, again, back in that DMV area for um, an additional four years. Uh, so I taught for about eight years in the classroom, um, and like most teachers, I know that um, your wife was a teacher, so she probably had multiple jobs <laughs> throughout um, the career span, her career span. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, I like to say that I had a full-time teaching job, and then on the summers, I had completely different jobs, um, well, also related to education, but teaching for different audiences. So I've taught for community colleges, I've designed curriculum for summer programs, um, and I did all of that within my about the nine years that I was in the classroom and actively teaching. I got my secondary teaching credential as well, but jobs took me elsewhere. But my belief is that all of us can be, and, and in some senses ought to be teachers in one way or another, especially those of us who are somewhat different from most people. And we can take a couple of different approaches. And when people start asking us questions, like they ask me questions about being blind, can present it, or you can take the opportunity to make it a teaching moment. And I, it's certainly the better way to go is to let yourself be a teacher and recognize that that can be a very positive thing. Oh, no, absolutely. And I like the way that you described, described that, you know, there's something that I, I didn't anticipate that it was going to come with teaching. I think teaching, like when you're going through a teacher program, it's very much like pragmatic do this lesson, assign it to this. 
And one of the things I think that is missing from that is understanding how to speak to people, how to communicate with them, how to acknowledge them and how to speak life into them, if you will. And that is something that teaching has afforded me to do. It wasn't something that I picked up in a book necessarily, but over time and having that experience of teaching um, in a private school that was predominantly white um, and in a public school where white students were the minority, um, across that, I've had time to kind of reflect on what is it about teaching that gives you that experience and how is it that you can work with students from a wide range of backgrounds um, and what what does that look like? And how is it that you kind of focus on the individual as opposed to grouping everyone together in order to make that connection that really has the impact? What kind of a decision or determination did you make from all that as to teaching and and so on? Yeah, yeah so um, funny story, when I taught in Carlisle, Um, I, I, when I was getting my teaching degree, I was teaching at a school that I probably, um, would not even have been able to, uh, imagine before that, um, it was a very small school where the school campus had the elementary school, middle school, and high school on a little bit less than an acre. Um, and that school primarily served like a rural, uh, community one that was very different to growing up in the DMV area. Um, One where hunting was the key Mm. way that I had to figure out how to connect with students. Um, Not only that, I was the only, like one of the only black people, let alone teacher and an authority figure um, at that particular school. Um, And it afforded me um, challenges but also taught me a lot of lessons, Um, lessons about how you can gain and gather respect in a way that's not attributed to um, maybe a degree or a college or something of the sort. I think in this, or my experience has been in this DMV area that we place a lot of weight on maybe what your career is. Um, Like my husband, he's from Tennessee and he always laughs and says, I'm tired of people in D.C. asking me the very first question they want to know is, what do you do? Where do you work? Um, That is not how it is in Tennessee, where someone might open up and ask you something else about yourself. But I didn't realize that I might have had that like presupposition until I went into a community where those things didn't really matter. It was more important that I understood what was important to my students um, and that when I didn't understand it, I just said, hey, Michael, I really don't understand when you tell me that you're not going to be in school on November 28th because it's the first day of hunting season. What are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do that day? What does that look like? And I learned so much just from stopping and asking and receiving the information rather than assuming that I had any idea because, Michael, I did not. Mm -hmm. had no idea. Um, in fact, I was in a parent teacher conference with a parent and I remember trying to say like, oh, you know, like your student is so excited. They're going to, um, get ready for hunting season. And I said something to the effect of like, they mentioned that they're going to like see a deer or something like that. And the parent looked back at me and was like, we don't see the deer, we kill the deer. And I remember being like, but then also... (laughs) Being good like, point. all right, yeah. need to, yeah, good point, exactly. <laughs> and clearly I missed that component of it. Um, but what it taught me in that moment was like, yes, you're to elevate and celebrate something about that student, but you also need to make sure that you understand the culture to which resides there. Um, and that you say, hey, hey, I don't understand that. I'm willing to learn and to receive from you. There's nothing that I have that is going to be of more value Um, And having that um, kind of back and forth has really helped me to learn more about the world, more about experiences um, than I could have in any other way. So on the 28th of November, hunting season starts and kids miss school? Yes. So Mm -hmm. in this particular community, and I know it's November 28th because that's actually my birthday, 
And at the time it was my 21st birthday. It was coming up and I was like, Oh, I'm so excited. And then they were <laughs> like, we don't have school. Um, we don't have school. And I was like, we're no doing school? that because it's your birthday. Exactly. I was yeah. like, of course it's a holiday. Um, <laughs> but because, because hunting season is so prominent, schools will literally cancel that day mm. because kids won't be there. So instead of pretending and marking them absent, you go with the culture and you acknowledge like, this is important. It's going to happen. We're getting a day off. Everyone will be okay. <laughs> and school can pick up the following day after everyone has had that opportunity to start the season. Do kids come back from that day with lots of stories? They do. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, uh, one of my students came back with a prize for me. Um, so, you know, typically we think teachers or in movies and stuff, we see that teachers get apples on their desk. Um, another spoiler alert that doesn't really happen um, very <laughs> often. <laughs> or at least it didn't happen to me recently. But instead of getting an apple on my desk, um, one of my students bought me um, deer jerky. Oh. And yes. And I was like, okay, I had to give myself a little pep talk to be like, don't like freak out. Cause I, at the time, right. Like the student had explained to me after we kill the deer, we go hunting, we put it in like a cabin and then they like salt it down for long mm -hmm. periods of time. And I, all of this was like brand new to me. And I just remember he bought me a little brown paper bag and he's like, Mrs. Dunn, or at the time it was Williams, Mrs. Williams, I want you to, to taste this. Um, and I remember being like, this is, this is a sign of respect, right? This is my opportunity yeah. here to not scoff, not say anything, because it doesn't have to do with me. It has to do with the gesture. It has to do with him saying, like, this is something for you. And I will receive that gift in the same way that I would receive an apple. Um, and I did receive it and I held on to it as being something that was just a sign of respect to some different culture. And more importantly, an opportunity for me to learn um, what this other culture is. Um, and also where, where do I find myself in that, in that position, especially as a teacher being a black woman and teaching and they're, they're like, how is she going to react? And I was like, it's important that I react with respect in the same way that I would like for someone to do for me. And how was the deer jerky? It was delicious and fresh. <laughs> it definitely tasted better than like if you buy jerky at yeah. like another another place it was not the same um but it yeah. was good and and it was something that they did with their family right like but, it, but like, that jerky wasn't created the day before during the opening day of hunting season it was, it was not so yeah. thank goodness for that because that, <laughs> that would have been a whole nother story yeah <laughs> well that yeah would take longer to do that it it is interesting to to deal with different cultures and and even within the U.S. and just different environments. I remember once being invited to Brethert County, Kentucky, to do a speech, and it was a, a talk at a school. They had a program where they honored every student who had at least a C average starting in the sixth grade. And everyone got some sort of an award, but the more, the higher your grades and the longer you had higher grades, the higher the award that you got or the more recognition, if you will, to the point where by the time you graduated from high school, if you had an A average every grade from sixth grade on, there were like one or two people that actually got the, the most prestigious award. It was a wonderful time, but the event was held on a Monday evening in, um, well, it ended up being, I guess, in April. And I was told that the event would start at five. I had so long to give my speech. And then, the, and, and my speech would be the last thing because they did the awards first, which was great. But we had to end by 6.30 because the Kentucky Wildcats were playing in the <laughs> championship March Madness football game. And no one was going to stay in the gym after 6.30. And I will tell you that I ended in time. 6.30 came. And by 6.31, the only people left in the gym were me and the people who were driving oh, me back wow. to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is such a great 
exactly. So that experience of like, here's, this is what's important to us. <laughs> and right now. Needs to adjust. Yes. Yeah. And yes. you know, that's okay. It is, it is perfectly okay mm-hmm. for that. Um, as a speaker, it, it actually was one of the times that helped me realize that as a speaker, I'm a guest. Um, and I don't go to events to be conceited or have an ego or anything like that. And I've heard mm-hmm. stories about people who have really crazy things in their contracts. But my belief is that when I go to speak somewhere, I go as a guest and I want to add as much value as I can to being there. So I don't, for example, say, oh, you want me to do three speeches? It's going to cost this as opposed to one. I say, let's negotiate whatever you want to charge me. And then if you've got more than one speech you want me to do, I don't charge extra for it because my job is to add value and inspire and educate. And it's so much fun. In that case, it was a short, well, not a totally short speech, but it was a specific timed speech with a time limit to end everything by, otherwise I'd be shot. And I knew that if I didn't end on time, (laughs) I would have been in very serious trouble. (laughs) <laughs> so oh, yeah. i was a good kid i went home and ate and they actually gave me a a bag of uh, girl scout thin mints so i went home and ate thin mints and watched the game just being a good kid oh, well home that, in the in the hotel like actually yeah perfect evening <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> relaxation well, yeah i like that oh well, what can i say it was fun but you know um so you taught for nine years. And one of the things that strikes me is that you had a very diverse college background between English and African studies and then minor in education. You have a a very varied or a wide varied background. Um, That must help you in terms of how you mentally adjust to different things too. Yes. Um, And I will say that uh, my experience is that will very much motivate the way that I approach being a teacher as well as the way I approach being an educator and just a professional in general. Um, So I went to a Catholic school um, like from third grade to eighth grade, but this Catholic school is probably the most unique one (laughs) that you can find in the sense that my school was majority um, Black, majority African, West Indian, African American, um, Latinx communities. And then we had like very few um, white students. So, and where I look, the area that I lived in um, is right outside of College Park. Mm -hmm. And that area is predominantly Latino communities, like majority. Like when I would go to a grocery store, I could pick up exactly what it was that I needed, whether it was going to be something to make um, like empanadas or I wanted to make oxtail that is available in the stores where Mm -hmm. I grew up. Whereas in other areas, you're not going to find that you're going to have to go to a quote unquote international market. My whole community was just international. Um, And in eighth grade, we had to decide what school we were going to go to. And so we had like presentations Um, and there was a presentation from an all, a really small all girls school And I really liked the woman who gave the presentation. She was very kind. She talked about leadership. She talked about uh, how they have really small class sizes, things like that. So I came home and I told my parents, I said, oh, you know, I heard about the school and they seemed really nice. And it seems really awesome. I think I might want to go there for high school. And my mom was kind of like, what? Because neither of my parents went to school in the United States. Mm -hmm. So when you when you think about what it means to have parents that didn't necessarily go here, but they're supposed to help students navigate what it actually means, it can be a little bit confusing, right? It's a learning opportunity for all of us. Um, And the way that that story ended is that I went to um, a predominantly white all girls school in Potomac, Maryland. Mm. Very, very, very opposite, not only to my household, but opposite to the school that I was most familiar with. Um, And it was, again, a completely different culture. Um, I went to school with girls whose, you know, parents were in the military or uh, had businesses or had lived in the DC area for a very long time. And I 
um, had a lot of imposter syndrome that I went through as a student without really having a teacher who could see that, address it, and be able to create a safe space for me. So that experience um, was challenging, but again, was something that I thought about when I decided to minor in education and to pursue my secondary degree was, what is it like for other young um, um, Black girls or people of color or people of any kind of difference or any kind of diverse community what is it like when they have an advocate where they have somebody who, as you mentioned, is willing to say, I'm a guest in your world, as opposed to you need to subscribe to my world. What is that like? And how can I make sure that I um, use that experience to help others um, and to give them the knowledge that they, they might need to be able to navigate those different and differing um, situations and navigate that change well? Um, and navigate it with still a strong sense of self, um, not a sense of I have to completely get rid of my identity and assimilate into this, but rather, how can I still be my authentic self within the space? And how can I create a safer space for those that come after me? So you um, had this very diverse background in terms of what you studied, but I mean, it's pretty reasonably obvious why you chose African studies as, as a part of it, um, but you, you just innately recognize that there's value in really getting a very diverse kind of education, and, uh, and you did it not only in college, but you did it in high school and so on. I guess it all worked out in high school, even though it was so different for you. Yes, no, it worked out in high school. Um, and I still have like some of my best friends I, I gained in high school. Um, and I think that it gave me the opportunity to challenge my own fear about what people might assume about me or my family or where my family's from um, and seek out the opportunities to look at our differences, acknowledge them and still move forward. Not mm -hmm. a you have to do this or I have to do that. Like some of my um, some of my girlfriends, my best girlfriends came from that same background, but still will come to my house and eat beef patties with me. Or they still will eat oxtail that my grandmother has made out of respect for my family, but also an acknowledgement of our differences. And that is OK um, to have those differences. So for you. <clears throat> Excuse me, what does accessibility mean to you? Because I think it's a little bit different for different people. It amounts to the same thing, but what does accessibility mean to you? Yeah, so accessibility means access is the very first thing that I, I think when I think about accessibility. Um, and for me, when I came to this high school, um, I learned that a lot of the things I had learned in, in middle school and a lot of the things that I valued from those experiences um, were challenged when I got to high school. Um, and I had a, some difficulty kind of keeping up and learning the rhythm of the way that the school was functioning because it was so different than mine, not just content, but culturally as well. Um, and in that school, I also learned about um, accessibility and I learned about um, students having accommodations. That was brand new to me, completely brand new. It wasn't a conversation that I was having in the, the previous school that I was in, or at least I was aware of. And by the time I got to high school, what I recognized was that um, being in an all girls environment, they really uh, encouraged you to advocate for yourself, to advocate for what it was that you were going to need in order to be successful. Um, and I was just learning what advocacy was, right? Because I was in a community that was homogenous. We were all similar, all from different diverse backgrounds, but we were all pretty similar. Um, and when they got to high school, it was more of um, a, an opportunity to learn how to advocate. Um, for me personally, I think I had I got to observe and I learned um, like a sponge. I observed, absorbed as much about the other experiences that were different than my own, as well as how I was going to advocate um, for my own as well. Um, and then, of course, accessibility. I learned a lot, a lot um, in my education degree. Um, I learned a lot about um, 
understanding how things can be uh, overly complex or overly dependent on assuming that everyone's experience is the same. And it's simply not. Um, so it is my responsibility and responsibilities of educators to learn that those experiences are not just the same. They're not stock. Um, they need to be um, customized in a way that they're going to serve the needs um, of whomever it is that you're teaching or whomever it is that you're working with. Um, and so it's a topic that I find to be extremely important and also one that I am constantly learning more about um, and learning more about different experiences and how all of those things kind of come together so that you have a toolkit um, or a way that you can really think about um, how you're working with many different people and different experiences um, and how that all kind of comes together. Typically, if you talk to most people today about the whole concept of accessibility, they talk about people with disabilities and what's accessible or available and what isn't, as opposed to what uh, may be occurring with other kinds of diverse backgrounds, whether it be race and, and gender and so on. And you come at it from the standpoint of gender and race, certainly. How then does what you know help you, if you've had any experiences along those lines, deal with things like disabilities and recognizing where that fits into the scheme of things? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I come back to the word access and like it blows my mind to think that whether it was as a teacher or um, as a learning experience designer or myself, even as a parent, that I would say to somebody, sorry, you just can't access this. Sorry, this just isn't for you. Like, I don't understand how you could ever do that or say that. But when you actively don't address differences, needs, how you can make those needs equitable, you are kind of saying that. You're saying, sorry, this is just not for you. Yeah. Um, and I think that that also plays in with the the racial components as well. Um, when I think about race and I think about um, the voices that are often marginalized or minimized or just not included at all, all of those things go to access. All of those um, perspectives, they all go to, is this accessible? Can you access this? And if you can't, what can we do to ensure that you can access that? Not just you, but other people who might also have that need or desire. Yeah, and I think that's an extremely good way to, to put it because accessibility is a lot more than whether a book is available in Braille or recorded or in a form that I can use or not. At the same time, accessibility is as much about whether a book is in Braille, recorded, or I can read it or not. And we all too often try to create differences where they don't exist. That is to say, yeah, and I, I think that accessibility is accessibility, and it may take on any number of forms, but let's face it, and that's my favorite example to use, Every sighted person has the disability that you're light dependent and inaccessibility comes along as soon as there's a power failure and you have to go try to find a flashlight to get around. Mm -hmm. And, and we, don't, we don't recognize that anymore or to a large degree we don't. And we are unfortunately, I think, still way too often marginalizing different groups in one way or another. And we've got to start to recognize we're all part of the same thing. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head there, um, especially with those examples as well, like recognizing that for some people, like they don't even get to that recognition point yeah. um, or they're too uncomfortable to talk about it. Um, so in high, like, for example, in high school, those experiences, people didn't really want to talk about the fact that I was black or the fact that my family is West Indian or the fact that my mom is black and British. So when she shows up and she's like, hello, with her accent, people are really thrown off um, because they're like, 
uh, <laughs> you know, like that story, you know, it's, it's my own story. It's my own identity, but that story just hadn't been told. And sometimes people need to hear those stories in order for them to really understand the characters, if you will, of life. They're not all the same um, and they're not all one type of story. And the more that you welcome um, and acknowledge the differences there, the better the entire book is going to be because you can connect with so many more people. One of the the things I think a lot of people know is when we do these podcasts, I ask people to to give me questions in advance to help me prepare. And so I'm going to ask one of the ones directly that you brought up. What is the diaspora and how does the diaspora affect your view of the world? Yeah. Um, so since you uh, asked, I figured I would bring it up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, my own identity is very much a product of the diaspora. So um, we have a blackness or a black identity that's not just confined to African American, right? Um, and I and I think about it because it, it's something that I, I re- realized was a difference when my friends would come over to my house, my household, uh, the way that we would interact, the way that we would talk to each other was very much a product of my West Indian background. Not to be confused with going to um, a a friend's house who might actually be Mm -hmm. African-American that has their own culture and their own background. So the diaspora is the spread of um, Black identity due to the impacts um, of slavery and enslaved Africans that were spread all around the world. Um, That's why you can go to um, Brazil and you can see a very rich African identity in Brazil that might be very similar to the one that you'll see in Grenada or in Birmingham, England, um, or in parts of Canada, um, or actually on the continent of Africa. So that spread of, um, because of this horrible travesty, um, because of that, our identity is, is, it's spread out across and, and our culture is like a mix of different, different um, components. What do you do to address the whole issue of identity and teaching identity to your son? Um, Cause I know that's important to you and it certainly is relevant, but I'd love to hear more about that. Yes, um, absolutely. So uh, my mom, my mom, uh, from a very young age thought it was made it and very important in our household that we read books that included black characters, included black voices. Um, And she was so happy that when she came to America, there were so many more options than she had previously been afforded in the UK, especially during that time. So when she came here and there were like black dolls and black books, like those were things that she really, really prioritized in her house um, that helped us to be able to see ourselves in stories, right? Like I'm not going to necessarily be in like an Emily Bronte novel. Mm -hmm. However, I can still enjoy that particular novel um, and sit with my British mother, who's like, this is all that we read growing up um, and be able to experience that story is exactly what that is. That's that story. Um, and here's a young black woman reading that story and engaging with that story and, and understanding it. Um, so from that example, for my son, um, he is African American or he's black, he'll decide, you know, how he would like to identify. Um, my husband is West African, his family is from Liberia. Um, and then my family is from the West Indies. So between those two, we find it very important um, to acknowledge and celebrate our our cultures, um, our differences in our cultures, but also for him to know his family's history, um, for him to be able to um, have pride in that identity and where that identity will show up for him in the long run um, and across the interactions and his experiences in schools um, in the way that I have learned from my mom, um, from my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, how we've all kind of made sense of this home here in the United States. Well, it it's it, it's well. First of all, how old is Lucas now, your son? Lucas is four. Um, he so he's four in November. He's little. 
he's little. So this is a, a, a great adventure for him. And it will be fascinating. We're just going to have to do another one of these in a few years to see how he's doing with all of it. But one of the things that comes to mind, um, which I don't like, but it's interesting to have a discussion about it, is you got people in this country, for example, who say, well, why are we worried about all these different cultures? We're all American. And mm-hmm. how, do you, how do you react to that? I know how I react to that, but you first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, to some ways I don't, because it just doesn't make sense. Um, (laughs) if you look at the history of this country, um, it wasn't put together because we are in many ways an experiment, this country, we weren't put together to all say we're all American. Um, we actively acknowledge that we are, um, a melding of different cultures. Um, and that is how we all kind of came together to a certain extent in this place. Um, some of us were taken, you know, and enslaved. Some of us mm-hmm. came over voluntarily. Um, some of us have legacy of family that has lived here for quite some time. Um, but if you were to say, like, American, describe American culture, I'd be curious to know what you would say. Because American culture in Pennsylvania, where I went to school, um, in that very rural town, is very different than America in Bethesda, Maryland is different than America in Arizona or different than America in Texas. So I would ask them, how would you describe America or American culture? Because there's no way that you can do that without acknowledging the profound influence that all of these cultures have had. My observation would be that American culture means we are, we are now all, however we got here, we are all part of the same country and the country is made up of everything that you just said and more. And we should and must recognize that. But the other part about it is that we are all now in a country that we call America. And while we represent an incredibly diverse background, when we are pushed to it, First and foremost, we have to recognize that we are now part of this country, which means we defend it. We have subscribed or hopefully subscribed to the precepts that led to the Constitution and how the Constitution evolves over time. But again, it doesn't mean we refuse to recognize our incredible backgrounds. This this country is way too large to believe that we're all just one background and that's all there is to it. Yeah. And that just, you know, when we, yeah, when we think about um, how we all come together, like we, this wouldn't be the melting pot with all of the delicious spices and flavors if we just said, nope, it only looks this one way. Yeah. Burgers and burgers and fries doesn't work everywhere. Yeah, (laughs) it doesn't. Um, It can be delicious at times, but not every single day. Right. You got to have some, have some diversity in there. I rest my case. And that's exactly, (laughs) and that's exactly the the point. Um, It is unfortunate that all too often, if we talk about diversity, the people who do get left out are people with disabilities. If you ask most Mm -hmm. people, what does diversity mean? They'll talk about race and gender and sexual orientation and so on. And disabilities won't be talked about. And it is a conversation that we need to, promote as much as we can, because even according to the CDC, 25% plus of all people in the United States have some sort of a disability. And of course, my position, as I said earlier, is actually 100% due. It's just that one specific disability is so much covered up because the light bulb got invented, but it doesn't change the fact that there is a huge population that for any number of reasons, people don't want to deal with, maybe because in part they're afraid, well, it could happen to me, or it isn't something that is that is static. You are or you're not, and if you're not, you never will be because you can be a person with a disability, and the sooner we broaden our understanding of what that term means, which is the disability, as I also say, does not mean a lack of ability, but it's a characteristic 
-hmm. If we really get to the point of understanding that, um, it would greatly enhance, I think, a lot of attitudes around the country. Yes. No, absolutely. And I I mean, the, I think the key word is ability. I think people are just uncomfortable. Like people don't want to deal with what they can't put a nice bow on. They don't want it to be, you know, a, a situation where they either just don't understand or they've just chosen to, to not understand. Yeah. And when you yeah. challenge people on that, they're uncomfortable. They are. They don't and, like that. And as I said, we, we are very capable of changing definitions of words. We've done it with diversity since it doesn't include disabilities. And I submit that we can change what disability means. It is a characteristic that, in fact, we all have. It's just that our disabilities are not all the same. Hence, we're back to a diverse environment again. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. So you taught for nine years. Then what did you go off and do? Um, after I taught, I moved to be a curriculum specialist in English. Um, and what I did in that role was um, evaluate the curriculum in my school district um, and come up with ways that we can make our curriculum more diverse and more representative of the backgrounds um, that surrounded us. Um, so I evaluated text. Um, so I would read different um, young adult novels, for example, and um, uh, based on some criteria, say like, would this be acceptable for X age group? Um, and what is the message that is surrounding these particular topics? And how would a teacher engage in a discussion around these topics? Um, or how would a student engage in a discussion that ends in an essay, for example, that aligns with Common Core? Um, so I looked at that curriculum um, and evaluated it for those purposes and then made recommendations about how to be more engaging um, and how to be more uh, relevant um, for the time period as well as relevant for how the world and society was changing. Um, and so I, I did that for, for uh, about almost two years. Um, and then I made a huge transition and change, which was to leave the field of education or rather the traditional field of education. Um, and I transitioned into a learning experience designer role in tech. Um, so I have, I guess this is like my second life, but like nine lives. So I've got some time ahead of me, but <laughs> this is go. my <laughs> second life, um, if you will, out of the classroom. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised about how much those elements of the classroom show up in the tech space mm -hmm. and in the corporate world um, and how much I um, learned from teaching and really from hearing people's stories. Like as you do so well, listening to those stories, the same is still applicable um, when you're in a different space or when you're with a different age group. Um, the, a lot of those same tenants, I still find to be key to the work that I do. I'd love to hear more about what a learning experience designer is, but first, another question just popped into my brain, scary as it is <laughs> going back to your curriculum evaluation era. What do you think of what's occurring now where we're hearing about more and more books where people are rewriting part of it to eliminate language or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I ask that in part because my, my belief is that what someone wrote when they wrote it is part of history. And mm -hmm. we should keep it in that perspective, but rewriting it eliminates the perspective of what things were like at the time, and thus in part eliminating the opportunity to say we have or we need to evolve further from that. Yeah. So um, I, I'm trying to, um, so I can give you a couple examples of how, how I've approached this um, when I was teaching. I agree that there are some texts that are just, the way that they're written it is 100% um, encouraged, especially in the field of English, to critique that. Um, so you can decide what lens, what critical lens you want to use with that one objective text. Um, and then you can also open it up and say, 
let's talk about it further. Let's talk about what this really means. Um, uh, one example that comes to mind, I was teaching AP literature, um, which is actually a course that I was not admitted into when I was a student um, at this high school, but I felt redeemed when I could be a teacher of AP literature. So there. Um, and <laughs> and um, we were studying Othello, um, mm. which uh, we, you know, we're reading Othello and there's quite a few references, obviously, to the fact that um, Othello is of African descent. Mm -hmm. um, and that is quite controversial during the time. And, you know, we had discussions around maybe what some of those words were reading them, um, what those words meant, like why we were saying the more as mm -hmm. opposed to referring to him as his name. Um, that is a concept that we could take out and talk about in 2023. Um, and what I did was as I had my students um, read some of uh, some articles about um, Meghan and Harry um, and the way that Meghan was talked about in the British media um, versus the way that she might have been talked about in the American media. What were some of the differences and the nuances there that we saw? So we can read Othello and we can have question marks around what are they really trying to say here and who is Shakespeare? But we read that text in the way that it was written, but we can talk about it and discuss it in the way right. that, that those same concepts appear in the present. So think, you, you you have to do both. You have to 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 do both. Go ahead. I I think the latest one I've heard about is now we're rewriting some of the James Bond books because there's some specific language regarding um, blacks that is offensive. But the other point that was made by the news person who was telling the story was they're not dealing with Asians in it. And, um, you know, mm. why are we rewriting it at all? It's not something that was written today. And we should be using the, the writing that we had back then as teaching moments to say, we've evolved from that. So change it today. But this is what was there and don't get rid of it. It's part of our past. It's part of our history and it is something that we really should continue to, um, you know, to keep around. I'm appalled every time I hear about a school that, for example, wants to ban To Kill a Mockingbird of all books. Oh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I, <laughs> to Kill a Mockingbird, um, I personally love that novel. But mm -hmm. yes, I have heard the argument that we should get rid of it. Um, and I, the first time I taught To Kill a Mockingbird in high school was in that rural school. Mm. Um, and I remember having to, there was, there were, there was one black student in the class, um, and he was biracial. Um, he, I think his mom was white or his dad was black. And I remember telling him, <laughs> I pulled him aside and I was like, Hey, we're going to be talking about to, to Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and we're going to be talking about this particular scene. And I want you to know that I'm not going to ask you to speak up or say anything because it's not your job. Um, but I want you to, 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 you know, be present in our discussion, but if you feel uncomfortable, you can leave and it is okay. It's like, I'm, I'm the teacher and <laughs> you will be okay. Um, but I want you to, to feel comfortable and I don't want you to feel like out of place as we're talking about the way that Tom Robinson was chastised and pushed mm -hmm. out of his community, you know? Um, and I, you know, I, I felt, I, I wasn't sure what to do, right? Like I'm at that point, I was 20 years old mm -hmm. um, and everyone else didn't look like me and my experiences engaging with Tom were not going to be the same as anybody else's, but I don't shy away from that. Um, I tried to lean into that moment to see what I could learn and, and that student, he was fine. He probably was more fine than I was, to be honest. I was um, just going to ask how he reacted yeah. or what his thought was. He was, I think he was a little bit shocked. Um, I think that he was kind of like, wow, she actually acknowledged um, where I am or where why reading this book in particular would be a problem. Um, the same way that I acknowledged and I said to the students, I'm not going to say the N word because that is not a word that sure. I use. It's not a word that's part of my culture. Um, and I would prefer that you don't use it. But if you do, just keep it to yourself. Like there are little nuances, especially with these, these older novels, as you're describing, that um, you, have to, you have to decide what your approach is going to be because that conversation is going to happen. 
Um, but as you're pointing out, we are all also, we can look back at those texts and say, I'm so glad that we don't describe characters like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm so, so glad that Atticus was going to go against the grain and stand up for what he believed was the right thing to do, despite the influences to do something different. And more important, how he used that to help Scout grow. Yes. Which is, which is really the the cool part of the book and well it's all i thought it was a great book and it is one of my favorite books and it has been ever since i had the yeah. opportunity to read it so i'm with you well yeah. what <laughs> what is a learning experience designer yes so i'm coming up on my one year of transitioning into this role and so i'm so glad <laughs> that you're asking me this now and not within like the first 6 months or so because i was not 100% sure um, but a learning experience designer um, designs learning from a variety of um, areas. So um, like a typical day for me will be putting together trainings on um, like a technical service. Um, and so I find myself spending a good amount of time wading through very complex documents um, and making them more digestible um, and then making sure that they are accessible. So um, one of the first projects that I did, um, or one of the first opportunities I really had to apply my uh, teaching skills was to critique our current content um, to, to make sure that it was accessible. Um, so to do that, I uh, taught myself how to use uh, um, the screen reader um, and to use NVDA um, applications to be able to test all of our content and be able to point out when things were not going to work, why they were not going to work, and mm -hmm. what we were obligated to do to improve that. Um, so uh, it's learning, um, but it's also a little bit of content design, content management. And then because I'm in the tech space, it's a lot of, for me personally, learning about crazy advancements in technology that I didn't even know <laughs> were happening. Um, and so I have had that opportunity um, and definitely a window of influence to identify when our content was not going to be accessible, depending on who was going to take it, but also when our content was really complex and certain words are not going to localize well, they are not going to translate um, and they are not quite frankly, going to be at the seventh or eighth grade reading level. And I know that because I've taught those age groups. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming in with that perspective, um, I think has re really kind of helped our content evolve to the level where it needs to be, where we can make sure it's accessible. But when it's not, we have a way to address it. Instead of just saying, oh, well, just do something else. No, 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 no. <laughs> we need to figure out how to improve this. Um, what are our options and what do we have available to us and there's also a large community that would love to help in any way if things come up that you can't answer yourself and um mm -hmm. so i'm 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 hoping that you you do consult them but that's pretty important to to be able yes. to do because oh, yeah. accessibility is a is a moving target and not everyone is at the same level, needless to say, of understanding all of that either, which is always yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Well, you also have your own business. Tell me about that, if you would. Oh, yes. Um, so my business is called Nuggets of Knowledge. Um, and in, uh, in my business, I focus on working with uh, students of color who are also on their educational journeys. Um, similar to how I was, um, similar to needing to understand how um, a particular school might work or what do I need to do to prep for the SAT or, man, I'm in AP literature and I don't understand any of these texts that we've gone through. Um, and I have this test coming up and I need some help. Um, and the name actually is a merger of my own experience, um, gaining that knowledge Um but also uh, a nickname that I have for my son is Nugget. And um, one of the reasons that uh, teaching became particularly difficult for me was 
Um, after I had my son, I had, you know, very little maternity leave or opportunity to spend with him. Um, and I was really hoping to find a different way that I could combine um, my love for learning, uh, my passion for education with um, empowering others and empowering other parents. Cause like when I became one, I was like, oh, wow, uh, these parent teacher conferences make a lot more sense now um, than they did when I <laughs> was 20 years old and didn't really have that perspective mm -hmm. um, to, to go off of. Um, so I, uh, I tutor students and then I also um, develop uh, learning content for parents who are not educators who would like their child to um, develop, especially English language skills that will um, maintain and sustain their educational journeys. How do you think, here's a good thought provoking question for you. How do you think that the artificial intelligence world like chat GPT and the Microsoft mm -hmm. chatbot and so on, how do you feel that they can or will over time fit into helping things like nuggets of knowledge or just people in general in terms of getting knowledge as opposed to worrying about the bad side of it? Well, Michael, don't quote me, but I'm scared. I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going <laughs> to, like, if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, the the times that I've used chat GBT, I've been like sh shocked. I've been like, man, like there are not enough Boolean operators in the world to get down to this very specific search um, that this, you know, program is doing for me so quickly. Um, and I think that there's a lot of like, um, there's positives in that it can give you something really quickly, probably faster than you can think about it. But when we think about learning and we think about life and we think about experiences, it's very difficult to contextualize Correct. that text that might come out of it, but not actually be able to apply it in a real life scenario. Yeah. I think it is like anything else. It's got its positive aspects and the negative aspects and, and parts of it are things that we're going to have to grow and learn to deal with. But yeah. any way that we can improve our ability to access information if we will truly use that wisely is important and the if we can truly use that wisely of course is the operative part of that there are always people that like to stretch the envelope in not so great ways but it it seems to me that the potential is there it's how we develop it and fit it into our world yeah no, absolutely. Like, what are the, you know, what are the guardrails that we're going to put on it? Or is it just going to take some time and some oopsies yep. <laughs> before we're like, oh, okay, that doesn't work. Um, like with other things in history. Hello, exactly right. And it's, <laughs> it's all about letting the process or helping the process evolve. Uh, but to deny the existence and to say, this is so horrible, we can't use it anymore is not helping our ability to vision and and grow either right yeah no absolutely absolutely how long has nuggets of knowledge been in existence um i'm going into my third year um so i have actually been tutoring for eight years or so um, and in 2020, I decided to um, actually file as an LLC and become um, a business itself. Mm. Um, and I have found it to be really helpful. Um, and I found it to be um, a reflective experience for me as for my self student or my younger student self, um, as well as forward thinking about what it means to be a parent um, and what is important um, and what is information that I might have through my experience that other parents might not have um, at all or have access to um, because they are just like in a different field or, or a different industry. Um, and I really, I, I mean, I love being a learning experience designer, but I absolutely love working with students. And so this is like a mesh of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, just a mesh of both worlds. Do you have students um, all over or is it all in person or 
How do you do that? Um, yes. Yeah, so right now, so right now I've been my, mainly doing virtual, um, but I have met some students in person in the past like few months. Um, and uh, those students tend to be like college essay uh, st- or students that are getting ready to go to college. Um, so they have a little bit more autonomy to be able to drive to places um, as well as kind of talk about what they would like to see in their long-term future. Um, and one one thing that I did with Nuggets of Knowledge that um, really kind of helped me um, <laughs> say, hey, Ashley, like try this and do it and commit to us um, is that in the summer of 2020, I launched um, an entirely virtual summer program um, that was a half day academic program. And I did gr- grades three all the way up to grades 11. So I developed curriculum and I taught um, online. We did games like we did like an escape room a grammar escape room um which is a lot more fun that might sound from the title <laughs> but we no, did uh, love, you know like a grammar it sounds a lot of yeah. fun <laughs> yeah I, I mean i was having a great time and also like that was during the the time period where everyone was really kind of in a face with what does it mean to learn from home um what does it mean to learn to uh you know, learn in this type of environment. Um, And I'm really grateful for the families that said, hey, I'm going to try it and I'm going to see how it goes. Um, And the students had a really great time um, and just got more familiar with what at the time I didn't know, but would continue on for the next entire school year, which is learning virtually. Yeah, and certainly the pandemic has, uh, has opened up that vista. Well, This is really (laughs) a a lot of fun to do, but I have to ask, what did you feel or how did you feel about being asked just to come on Unstoppable Mindset? Because you've got such a wide, diverse background. I'd be interested to know what your thought was when I said, let's do this. Yeah, I I was a little bit shocked. Um, I guess I just, um, I wasn't expecting it. And I said to myself, you know, like, You've done some things recently, um, such as leaving the classroom. That was a big change. What happens if I just started saying yes more than I started saying no? no? Um, And what would happen if I tried something new? Um, And then uh, we had like a call together and I just felt like you had such a warm like spirit. I felt like you were very engaged. Um, And so that made it even more so that I was like, it's not just any invitation. It's an invitation from Michael, who's an esteemed um, author um, who has lived this amazing life and to spend time um, and to share little nuggets um, of my own life with you. is It's an experience that I cannot pass up on. And let me just say, I didn't pay her to say that sports fans. So no. <laughs> well, well, thank you. What would you like the audience to take away from all of this? And that'll be my last question because we've been going a long time here. And we're having yeah. so much fun. <laughs> yeah. It must be dinner time for you, but no, go ahead. Um, I would love for the audience to. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would love for the audience to um, just kind of look around and think about who are those people in your life that you can learn more about? Um, what do their stories have that will challenge you or change your perspective? Um, and a little bit about your own story. I, I believe that everyone has a story. Everyone has a culture. Everyone has a perspective. Um, I just think that some people spend more time thinking about their identity because they ha- how they show up in the world than others do when they can just kind of go along with the flock. Um, but I would encourage everyone to look for those opportunities to learn something new or to do something new um, and to really grow your mindset and your perspective because it's amazing what happens when you take that path. And in all seriousness, I would say to anyone who does that or who has done that, we would love you to come on Unstoppable Mindset. I'm always excited to have the opportunity to meet new people, hear stories, and and do all of the things that we have done today. So if you have any story to tell, be brave and come on Unstoppable Mindset, and I promise we'll have fun. Did we have fun today? We had so much fun. I would encourage you all to, to, to say yes to the invitation um, and think about yourself as having something to say and well, having and, a story. And come and invite yourself. And I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. But for oh, yeah. Ashley, how can people reach out and learn about you, learn about nuggets of knowledge and, and so on? 
Yes. So um, I, my name is Ashley Dunn on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect with people. I'm into talk, especially my former teachers out there. Um, And um, nuggets of knowledge. Um, I have a Facebook page um, where I post nuggets of knowledge um, about weekly. Uh, Last month, we did a a whole Black History Month series with Black texts that you can read with your students immediately. Um, And I have an Instagram, um, which my handle is teach with Ash D. Um, and I also have, I think I mentioned my LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, those are the main ways. And what's the <laughs> Facebook, channels. what's the Facebook page called? How do um, people find Nuggets it? of Knowledge. Okay. Oh yes. It, the, it's Nuggets of Knowledge LLC. Um, so okay. I am a business, uh, on, I have a Facebook business page. Do you have a website? Yes, I have a website as well. Thank you, Michael. You're so good at this. Um, <laughs> my my website is nuggetsofknowledgellc.com. There you go. Well, I hope people will reach out. I hope that they will take the time to meet you and make contact and get to know you and can share like you're sharing. And I think that will be a lot of fun to do. So I hope that you will get some some insights from people and some people for nuggets of knowledge courses and so on. And I want to thank you again for being here. And now, if anyone would like to come on Unstoppable Mindset and invite yourself, that's perfectly fine. You can do so by emailing me, Michael H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. Michael H I at accessibility.com or go to Michael Hingson, H I N G S O N.com slash podcast. And you can see all of the episodes there as well as reach out to me. And I would love to hear from you either way. And of course you can, and maybe a lot of you have already done. So found us on other podcast places, anywhere where podcasts are available, you are able to find us. And I hope that you will. And please give us a five-star rating. I'll appreciate it. Ashley will appreciate it. We like getting good ratings and good vibes (laughs) from people. Yes, absolutely. So I hope that all of you will do it. We're glad that you came today. And Ashley, especially, I'm glad that you were here. And I want to thank you one last time for being here with us today on Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much.